This is the iconic red kite, a striking raptor that plays an important role in its ecosystem, both as a predator and as a scavenger. Unfortunately, when growing up in the UK in the 90s, there were only a few breeding pairs left in Wales, so I never got to see these birds in real life. It was around this time that an ambitious project reintroduced red kites from the much healthier Spanish population to try and save the species in the UK. This project was a resounding success and the population grew to more than 4,000 breeding pairs, which means I get to see them when I go back to the UK to visit my family. However, in my new home in the Iberian Peninsula, where the reintroduced red kites came from, the population has dwindled and is now declining at an unsustainable rate, which is why we would like to help and do something about it. Hello there, I'm Matt, the other co-founder at Mossy Earth, and today I'm really excited to show you the release of the first 30 red kites we're reintroducing to the Iberian wilderness. In this video, I'd like to explain to you why we're reinforcing this species in Spain, as well as show you their journey all the way from the UK, and of course, the thing you're all here to see, their final release back into the wild. Before we get into the red kite release, I want to tell you a bit more about them and the challenges they are facing. The red kite, or Milvus milvus, is a medium-large bird of prey and one of the few species of raptors endemic to Europe. You can recognize them by their distinctive long forked tail, reddish color, and their effortless gliding. They typically weigh in at about a kilo, stand 70 centimeters tall, and can boast a whopping 180 centimeter wingspan. Red kites can live up to about 25 years and are mainly a lowland species relying on a habitat of open farmland, valleys or wetlands for finding food and mature broadleaf woodlands for nesting and roosting. As both scavengers and hunters, their diet consists of a mix of carrion and whatever they manage to hunt, and they are impressive hunters. They manage to dive at speeds of up to 180 kilometers per hour, and their prey usually consists of small birds and mammals, and occasionally even reptiles and amphibians. Earthworms are also a major part of their diet, especially in spring, which is something I found quite curious as it's not something we usually associate with such an imposing bird of prey. But who am I to judge? The global red kite population is estimated at about 60 to 70,000 birds, mostly concentrated in Western Europe. This is clearly a healthy and sizable population, but here in Spain, there has been a dramatic decline and they are listed as endangered. With their southernmost populations in the Iberian Peninsula at a critical level with less than 50 breeding pairs. So, the first and most obvious question is why is this population declining so rapidly? At a local level, they suffer from breeding habitat degradation and they can also get electrocuted, shot and even captured. But the biggest culprit of all is poison. That is both direct poisoning targeted at the birds and indirect poison consumed by scavenging tainted carrion. Our project will aim to address all these threats to ensure the population recovers, but more on this later. I think now it's time to introduce you to Alfonso Godino, our partner in this project. Alfonso is a keen ornithologist, environmental consultant, all round nice guy, and the manager of the Amos Red Kite Life Project. These are essentially the EU funding instruments that are often used by conservationists to fund their work. So in 2018, having witnessed the red kite's demise in his native Spain, while at the same time seeing the success of the red kite reintroduction program in the UK, Alfonso decided to put the wheels in motion for a pilot Euro kite life project that would reinforce southern Spain's red kite population. The idea of the project was to replicate the UK's success, but in reverse, to reintroduce 90 to 100 red kites from the UK to Estremadura in Spain over a three year period. Four years and many grey hairs later, we are proud to be working with Alfonso and enabling this life project to fly. To begin, the RSPB, Natural England and the Forestry Commission combined to collect the first 30 six-week-old chicks from different sites in central England where red kite populations are currently thriving. They could not film these activities, but we are able to show you the rest of their journey. Within just 48 hours of leaving their nests, the birds were put into crates and loaded on a flight destined for Madrid. I've just arrived from Portugal in Estremadura in the southwest of Spain and yeah, believe me, it's hotter than you could imagine. Now, despite a very long journey from the UK, the red kites are safe and sound. They've left uh, Madrid airport and they are en route to the center as we speak. After the birds arrived here, the resident vets, Anna and Beatrice, checked and recorded each bird's vitals, including blood analysis, weight and wingspan. This is not only good practice, but ensures we have solid baseline data on the newly arrived birds. The vets worked carefully and efficiently non-stop for several hours, putting each of the 30 birds through its routine checkup. So all the birds have passed their vet checks um, and they're now in this sort of 
holding pen just to chill out after the long journey before being released in a couple of days. The large pen helps them to acclimatise to the Spanish climate and eat after a long journey before they go into the aviaries. Then, the following day was the final leg of their journey to the release site. Today we were up early and we've taken the birds about an hour and a half west of the wildlife centre to a small village on the Spanish-Portuguese border and location of the release site. So this is the next stop for the birds. We're here on a private estate in Estremadura um, and the birds will go into these aviaries behind me for about one to two weeks and the idea is that they will be fed and once they reach a size where they can take the GPS backpack they'll be GPS tagged and then released and the idea is there to fly west. There is a network or a chain of feeding stations going to the west which will encourage them to fly in that direction. Matthew, tell something. <laughs> I hope she's not going to bite. <laughs> Such a beautiful creature. Yeah, it is. The birds will be in there for a couple of weeks before they are set free. So I thought I'd show you a bit more of the surrounding area, as well as explain how we will address some of the existing threats. The intervention area for the release and monitoring of the red kites is characterised by what you can see behind me, which is rolling hills and valleys of olive grove plantations, vineyards, cereal crops, dotted with farmsteads and villages. There are roads crossing through it, there's electricity pylons, there's even a train line running through. So this is not untouched wilderness. This is an area where man and wildlife have to coexist. I think the real key to success in this project is putting protection measures in place to minimize the existing threats to the red kites. Now our partners, Amas, have been working tirelessly in this area. In terms of uh, deliberate poisoning, they work closely with local rangers that have dog specialised in the detection and investigation of deliberate poisoning. In terms of shooting and capture, an awareness campaign has been put in place across all of the local hunting associations. Um, the local electricity company has prioritised the maintenance and repair of any faulty power lines within the intervention area. And in terms of wind farms, there are no wind farms in the intervention area, nor are there any plans for wind farms to be built. Okay, so in between all of this, you might be wondering, what are we actually funding and why does an EU-funded project need help? We are coming in with about €48,000 to be used over the next three years. This money will cover all sorts of expenses associated with the aviaries, the release and the monitoring of the birds with the GPS tags. The full size of the project is €677,000, so we are only 8% of the total budget. However, as co-funders, we have a special role to play. You see, Eurolife projects will usually give you 50 or 70% of the budget you need and expect you to deliver 100% of the promised results, which usually leaves conservation organisations to find the extra co-finance. If they do not manage to deliver on 100% of the project, the EU could ask for the money back, which of course would be disastrous. So you could say our budget helps to ensure that this does not happen. We will also be publishing our project management documents on our project pages following a revamp. But for now, I've linked the PDF below with all the details. Because funding is so important, I have to explain again how we got it. Here at Mossy Earth, we run a membership that aims to restore wilderness, which we do through a variety of reforestation projects in places such as Iceland, the Carpathians, Scotland and the Danube, as well as impactful rewilding projects such as flooding forests to restore wetlands, bringing back termite mounds to fight desertification and even restoring kelp forests in the ocean, among many other such projects. We have a Discord server to chat with the team and an app to track your impact and joining is actually quite cheap. Pretty much what you'd pay for tapas and a nice cold cerveza here in Spain. So if you're interested or would like to learn more, there is a link in the description below as well as a pinned comment. Before releasing the birds, they were wing tagged, ringed and fitted out with GPS loggers to help gather data and to monitor the project. The GPS loggers weigh 25 grams and are attached like a backpack with Teflon ribbons tied across the bird's breast. I'll let Alfonso explain further. So thanks to the GPS, we are able to detect the mortality really fast in less than 24 hours and start the protocol with uh, the police, uh, wildlife service to analyze the dead cows and if it's a crime of poisoning and shooting, police will follow the, the process. And for example, if it's an electrocution, we contact with the electric company to, to correct and try to avoid this problem in the future. The wing tags and the rings will also help with tracking the birds and Alfonso hopes that people will send in their photos of the red kites and help them to gather data with that too. I really like this as it's not only a fail-safe for the GPS, but also an engaging and important citizen science opportunity. Now it's finally time to release the birds. 
the last day is here and the final piece of the puzzle. We're up at 4.30 a.m. to go and open the aviaries. At a little after five in the morning, under the cover of darkness, the aviary doors were opened. In the darkness, I managed to film one or two of them leaving, but it was only after it became light that I could actually show you the birds. The release is not as you'd probably expect. Less of a mass stampede to freedom and more of a meander. And there they go. Despite the minimal fanfare, it was an emotional experience which I was proud to be a part of. This cycle of 30 birds is to be repeated each year for the next two years until 90 to 100 birds have been released into the Spanish wilderness. This is just eight more than the 82 released in the UK 30 years ago, but we're hoping to have equal or even better results. So I'd like to say a special thank you to our members who supported this project. If you're not yet a member but found this project exciting and worth supporting, then consider heading over to mossy.earth to check out our work and to become a member. Until next time, cheers.